Hi there, I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is part four of a special edition of Rook. This is Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian Obsession, Part 4, coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. Also, for all the episodes in one place of this series, you can see them at our website, rookmedia.com. Here's a little bit of what we heard on Part 3 of this series. It's like a football team that gets used to losing, and it just can't handle winning and uh, I think that's the case with a lot of old countries like Iran, Egypt and, and, and these older countries that have gone through a lot. I went to that gig with uh, three Iranian friends and one uh, English friend and uh, he was amazed that we knew all the lyrics and we knew and he was like this is a band from my parents generation like it's why do you guys care about them right, why do you right. why i remember uh when the wall came out i was uh, i was of course a teenager but we lined up and it was at the beginning of the revolution so the suppression of music was not there yet it oh, was that's getting interesting there. so in this final episode of our series we address storytelling classics and conclusions with Logar Ramin Torquion in Los Angeles, Anoush Sabuktakin in New York, Sanos Sotude in Dubai, and Arash Mitui in Tehran. Here now is part four of Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian Obsession. Well, our first guest on part four of our series is an internationally recognized composer and a highly gifted multi-instrumentalist and a member of the popular band Niaz. Logar Ramin Torquion was born in 1964 in Tehran, moved to the United States as a teenager after the 1979 Iranian Revolution. He co-founded the successful world music group Axiom of Choice together with singer Mamak Khadem in 1992 and is well known for his best-selling global rock fusion band Niaz, which he formed with Azam Ali in 2005. Ramin's unique talents have been featured on many major film scores, including Body of Lies, Iron Man, and The Prince of Persia. And right now, Loga Ramin Torquian joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello, sir. Hi, Jean. It's good to be back on your program. Good to have you back on. And I can't think of a better person. I mean, we've been exploring the this interesting intersection of Iranians and Pink Floyd. And you are, as well, very well placed to give us some perspective. So uh, let me just start by asking you if you remember where or when or how it was that you really first became aware of Pink Floyd while you were in Iran as a kid. Yes. Yes. First of all, I was a huge, huge fan of uh, Pink Floyd. I must have been uh, like around 12 years old, uh, living in Tehran. And the first recording of Pink Floyd that I heard was the um, album called Animal. And that was the one that I was just so mesmerized and I would kept listening to it over and over again. And then when I moved to United States, obviously, I purchased all of their records and I was a huge, huge fan. So where would you have, I mean, Animals is a pretty, that's post Dark Side of the Moon, it's post uh, Wish You Were Here. It's a pretty sophisticated and dense record for a kid to, to get into. Where? How did you discover Animals? Was that, did you have an older sibling? or something that passed this no, on to you? No, actually a neighbor of mine gave it to me to listen to and uh, and that's how I got it, you know. It's I and obviously at the time I you know, I didn't I wasn't fluent in English, but still there was something there 
that you know that I wanted to make made me want to listen to it and kind of the visuals you know that uh, was in the in the you know in the on the cover of the this cassette tape and I remember that very well and all that it was just so captivating were you in Iran? Uh, you were in Iran until a couple of years after the revolution, as I recall. So, you you were there when the wall came out. No, actually, I left uh, December nineteen seventy nine. Oh. So I left right, right, right the, at the cusp, right there, right, right there, the cusp yeah. of the revolution. And you yes. would have missed the wall then, because I think it came out a, right. a couple of That's months right. after that. So you That's experienced right. the wall once you got to the United States. That's right. That's right. Why do you think? Um, I mean, you can speak partly from your personal experience, but partly from what you know about uh, Iranians, you know about the, the music that has come out of Iran and has been explored and, and celebrated in the Iranian diaspora, and you know about the access to music issues that occurred after the revolution in Iran. What is your sense of why Iranians have such a, a connection and affection for Pink Floyd, disproportionately so? Yeah, first of all, uh, anything I say is a personal opinion. Obviously, you know, I have never done a study on this, but <laughs> actually I have reflected on this concept because it is a, it, it was a phenomenon. And I would go back to say that for any artistic expression to take seed and to for a culture to kind of accept it and embrace it, in the way that we did about Pink Floyd, first there must be a certain uh, circumstances within that society that makes it receptive. That is very important. And then you, there must be some sort of a trace of a cultural uh, roots that it makes that expression uh, familiar to okay. us. And therefore we, we kind of are ready to accept it. What do I mean by that? The, one of the most uh, uh, important elements of the Pink Floyd music is that it, tells an, it has a narrative and it tells a story. And if you look at that, we have a very long, uh, old tradition in that, from Naqali, Shahnameh Khani, from Ta'ziya. These were all musicals. They're like Broadway shows, but in, in its own way. But what what is the content? They're, they're trying to tell us a, a very dramatic story in a musical context. And I think... One of the most important elements of Pink Floyd and why we kind of were ready to accept it and we did not reject it is because it was telling a story. And and when we talk about popularity, we're talking about a very particular demographic of Iranian. We are not talking about the Iranian that, you know, the, uh, that lived in the rural, rural right, area. Right, right, we're talking sure. about the young urban Iranian that were faced with a few very important factors in their life. One was that during the Shah was very rapid assimilation that would it was encouraged for them to, to, to do. That is, in another word, to be westernized. Yep. And that is a, a some sort of invasion. That's some sort of a confinement. It's sometimes conformity that was that was being asked so therefore like the story of money the materialism the the institution that it is asking you to conform and interestingly enough even after the revolution in my opinion that institution still existed in a different form a conformity and the idea of wanting to break away that's the narrative of their and the message in the Pink Floyd that resonated so well with the young Iranian that wanted to find its own identity. Okay, so everything you've said so far is super smart, uh, even brilliant, excellent, uh, and it's a really good case for why the Who should be really big in Iran. Uh, because uh, if you're talking about narrative and storytelling, you've got Tommy, you know, arguably the first rock opera, you know, and with a with a, an amazing narrative. If you're talking about a rebellious anti-establishment message, you got Teenage Wasteland, My Generation, and yet I don't remember throughout my lifetime very many Iranians coming up to me and going, 
man, uh, you know, that, that Who Are You album, that really inspired me. It's Floyd has had this place of prominence that didn't exist for bands like The Who or Rolling Stones, which, of course, outside of Iran are always up at the top of the list. Even if Pink Floyd's there, you'd say the Beatles, Stones, The Who, etc. So how do you explain that disconnect? Yeah. Actually, first of all, who who's who? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> How dare you? Because, How no, because dare you actually, as a guitarist? <laughs> Pete Townsend, you should be worshipping Pete Townsend. <laughs> because I was not a fan of who. It's interesting, no? Yeah. Because there is another aspect of Iranian culture that we have to explore, and that is the our infatuation with sensarium. And that is to alter our senses is again another thing that it is very deeply rooted in our culture, If it, whether it was through food or biology, mysticism, um, you know, drug, drugs, let's talk about it, you know, alcohol, opium, there is a huge, huge emphasis on sensarium. We have a very simple word for it in Farsi, to get to a point of hal. And actually, this is something that it's very untangible and yet very real. That is the, the that's the interesting part of Hall. And and Hall, one thing that it does, it expands the silence and the the space within something that it is very confined. It makes the silence or the the space between melodies just as important as the melody itself. It transforms the space that you are in it, both love, as I a listener it. and as a participant, as a musician. And that is something that it existed in their music. Is Hall always related to drugs? No, it's no. also related to food. Oh. <laughs> right, but I, but to, so, because the drug part, let me take it one at a time. The drug part, sure. I'm glad you mentioned that because very few people have, but Arash Sobhani made the case that he thinks Pink Floyd, uh, part of why Pink Floyd became such a mainstay after the revolution was because it was passed along by brothers and sisters and older folks uh, to those who didn't have as much access to music anymore. And why were people disproportionately interested in Pink Floyd before the revolution? Because of Tehran and, and um, high society drug culture, exactly what you were just saying. That uh, and, and certainly growing up in the West, I've said this a few times on this special, but you know, as a kid in the 80s in, in Canada, for example, I always associated uh, Pink Floyd with with you know stoners. It was like a drug band, you know, kind of. Um, yeah. uh, not to take anything away from how amazing they are musically. In fact, that's part of the reason they're so amazing musically. Is you you know you can they can elevate you to the next level. Uh, so if we accept that drug paradigm, why else does psychedelic music like that um, end up connecting with Iranians uh, more so than than uh, again something like you know a great rock band like U two. Actually, well, U2 belongs to a different generation, but like we can compare it to Genesis and Peter Gabriel, which, you know, it more or less is, is a little bit closer in terms of timeline. And those bands, yes, actually those men also had a certain level of popularity, but I think it was a conjunction of almost like a perfect storm. You have, you have a, a, a youth culture that is telling a story that you relate to it, I related to it as a Iranian in a very kind of a suffocating environment. And I was forced to, and unconsciously I was forced to assimilate and I, there was so much contradiction. My parents were very different than me, but they wanted me to be very different than them. Uh, it's, it's actually very ironic, but in, you know, in Iranian, you know, they, they wanted their kids to be different than them. And, and that, with the regime, both pre and post revolution, that had these structures in place, then also at the same time you have a you have a musical form that allows for the hall to be there. Now, if it's inducive through drugs for that generation, it was not unique to their generation. You look at the many musicians pro in the traditional music of Iran. It's that culture is very related to opium. And the way that the opium made the musician express themselves in such form and for the for the listeners to hear it differently because they were also consuming the same drug. Same thing with Pink Floyd. It's, it is a psychedelic 
expression with a very potent uh, message and narrative. Let me ask you something about the musical nature of Pink Floyd. Uh, what Iranians were used to um, coming out of either classical Iranian music or even just popular modern uh, Iranian music was not so much the three and a half minute pop song, um, the, the sort of early Beatles style song, but but longer pieces of music that could sometimes be languorous or wandering or uh, musically, uh, even instrumentally improvisational. Uh, and that Pink Floyd, because it sort of peddled in that kind of, uh, in, in, in those kind of songs, that kind of music, that kind of stretched out elastic kind of music, uh, resonated. Does that make sense to you musically? Absolutely. I agree. Actually, I think another element, if I add to that, is that, you know, Pink Floyd is always mid-tempo. You know, you, you, who was very, was just too intense and too energetic at many moments in their albums if you listen the intensity builds up in pink floyd but the tempo is always mid-tempo and uh, the the idea of, of spiral music is something that it is uh, again has a very deep ro deeply rooted in our culture you listen to our traditional music, uh, you know, there is no verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you know, and then you listen to our folk music, it's just chorus, 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 there is, there is really no verse, you know, so this idea of verse, chorus is very Western, and it's, uh, you know, from our perspective, this idea of cup and ebb and flow and, you know, starting at a point and going in a spiral, you come back to the same point, but from a different perspective, it's not the same point. Although, although by and, the time we get to contemporary Iranian pop music, whether it's coming out of LA or not, it, it is very much verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Well, because that's assimilated music. Uh, you know, Niaz is assimilated music from that perspective. We write a lot of times, we, I mean, most of the times we write verse, chorus, and, the, and that is assimilated music. You know, this has been such a, an incredible learning curve doing this uh, uh, the special. It is such a, an incredible learning curve in the sense that we start off by talking about Pink Floyd, but then um, we're, we're learning so much. I'm learning so much about um, Iran, Iranians, uh, uh, my background, both culturally and musically. One of the things that um, was such a revelation that solved, uh, that, that opened, opened the doors up to why there's this connection with Pink Floyd very much so was Reza Mogadas, who we had on uh, part two of this series, said, um, because I was, I was putting the question to him, kind of, you know, pushing back on him. Well, why not Zeppelin? Well, why not Jimi Hendrix? Why not, you know, why, uh, why, why, why? And he said, you know, um, the distorted guitar sound is not something that Iranians have been socialized to really appreciate or like very much. So the fact that Pink Floyd was making this rock music, but that it didn't have that crunchy punk rock, you know, um, because especially later when we start getting into the, 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 you know, the wall resonating because it's got this anti-establishment message, my question would be, well, why not the clash then, you know, why not the mm -hmm. Sex Pistols? But if you don't, if you're not attracted to that sound, then you don't want that and and but you get it in pink floyd but you get a softer sound in the meantime can you speak to that uh that's i i totally would ag agree with reza i think there the, there is an element of um, there is a very lyrical element into pink floyd's music you you listen to the synthesizer parts that it is should be very outdated today with our standards. And actually I was listening to, to it with my son the other day and it still made sense. It still sounded very lyrical and beautiful. Just as a, yeah. as a sonic spectrum, yeah. you know, I'm not talking about anything else. Just as a sonic spectrum, it was delicious. And, and what I think were you listening was, to? What, what, which album or what song? Uh, Welcome to the Machine. Right. I was I was just listening to that long, you know, intro of the synths and kind of the the warmth and the the soothing 
aspect of it and i said boy you know like this this these are the sound this this sound still is relevant yeah. in today's the digital electronic world yeah. and how amazing that they were able to capture that because it's very lyrical it was it's so lyrical and again, it's very mid tempo, and most of the time, it's actually slow tempo yes. music. Yes. You know, and that is something that we we feel comfortable, and it's familiar to us. You know, it's so interesting that we. I mean, we always throw the the, the word timeless around when we talk about legendary <laughs> artists. But if you do, if you listen, I don't know when the last time you listened to Dark Side of the Moon is, but it it, it it is amazing the way it stands up. I mean, if you were to play other music that was coming out at that time, you know, the Bay City Rollers or Cliff Richard or something, it, you know, it sounds of a time. It's the early 70s. Uh, Dark Side of the Moon, it, is, it, it really doesn't have an era to it. I mean, um, uh, it, it, I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's the best selling album ever or, or you know, one of the most uh, uh, regularly selling albums ever. So that makes sense, but but uh, that's part of the magic that you're talking about, I guess. Yeah, and look at who actually was one of the producer of that album, which is Brian Eno, and he's a he's a legendary ambient musician uh, or producer. You know, his music is about nothing but space, and and kind of expanding that spectrum and one of the things that it is very common in in uh, ambient music is to be very modal hmm. and and kind of droney and for which us, sounds eastern exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> which to us is very again see i always go back to this that you know a culture must have to have a certain level of vocabulary or understanding within itself so it becomes receptive. That's why we rejected the distorted sound or very high intensity drum rolls that were kind of very, you know, like doubling the guitar riff. Because to us, we, we don't have a point of reference. This didn't exist before. So it's a new language. And therefore it would not it would it would take time for it to have a place. Especially it's then it's assimilating in a very different way. In a different context, it's as assimilating. Let me ask you a final question. It is what a treasure trove of uh, of uh, thoughts you are. I love I love talking Thank to you. you. Let, let Same me, here. Uh, let, let me ask a final question, and this is um, this is another musical question. You because you said you were a huge Pink Floyd fan from when you were a kid. Uh, you, you know you were a significant multi-instrumentalist you're a great player were you influenced by gilmore were you influenced by roger waters for that matter no actually the my early childhood training was on violin and so i was learning your traditional iranian violin techniques when i was in iran it was only after i moved while to loving Eugene. pink floyd <laughs> yeah while i love pink while you were floyd, listening to it's, dogs it's, on that's, <laughs> that's right <laughs> and the, the irony of it is that actually i kind of became more um kind of infatuated by uh, by kind of guitar at that earlier age was when i moved to eugene oregon and i was not led to sit in the orchestra because i was playing quarter tones and the instructor said, like, my God, you're all out of tune all the time. And I had to justify that's my culture that, that you know, we, <laughs> that it's not out of tune. It's actually a note that is very legitimate <laughs> because I went to audition and I played uh, jokingly aside. Actually, I went for, to audition and I decided to just play one of the Pish Daramats that I, you know, I, I, I knew how to play well. And I thought, oh, OK, this is going to really impress him. And it's a, in a pish daromat in, you know, in dashti, which, you know, it has two quarter tones in it. And he kept saying, oh, my God, you're so out of tune. And I, <laughs> and I took it personally, you know, and I, you know, actually, I stopped That's playing great. violin. I stopped playing violin and I, you know, I, I bought a very, very cheap, cheap guitar in a garage sale. And but, you know, from day one, I was always trying to play some sort of an Eastern melody on that guitar. Yeah. It's it's just that you know that you know that desire never went away. But you know I I, I felt like I have to assimilate because I was being rejected <laughs> musically from what I knew. I just uh, parenthetically though back back to the Pink Floyd fan. 
Um, and before I let you go, are you someone who continues with Floyd after what Roger? Do you do you like Division Bell? I mean, or or or, or does Pink Floyd have to include both David Gilmour and Roger Waters for you? If you not, know, Sid Barrett for that matter. You know, I'm I kind of like uh, to be very honest. Like for me, uh, Pink Floyd was a snap is a kind of a snapshot shot in time and i do not listen to to those to i mean there's i've heard them here and there and you know oh my god this is really such a nice sound but it inevitably reflects a certain style that i think it originated from pink floyd so it always makes me think of pink floyd and therefore i always go back to listen to original recordings and even today when I'm sharing with my son, who's now only 13 years old, but he loves Pink Floyd, is, you know, are the earlier recordings. Why does, Actually, why does he love Pink Floyd? I think he relates to the to the storytelling aspect of it. Interestingly Interesting. enough, he, but he really like you know he really loves the story. Wish you were here, you know. He he you know he he actually understands the the the, the message, you know, the anti-war message that it's in there, and the, you know it, it it was very socially, you know, they were, you know, they said a lot of nice stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, somehow simple and profound at the same time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And also it was very dramatic. You know, it's almost like a drama. That's it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, um, okay, I was going to let you go, but I actually thought of something that, that you you referenced when you talked about this not being music for the, the rural uh, set. You know, there was something that um, really hit home for me as well uh, from uh, – Amir Bahari, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's a music critic in Tehran and a journalist. And, and one thing that he was saying is, um, you know, the people who got into Pink Floyd, like there's a class element here. And the class element is the inverse of the West. I mean, as someone who grew up basically in the West like yourself, even though you were in Iran for the or your early years, you'll, you'll understand this. The whole romance of rock and roll, you know, from the West is working class kids. You don't need money to be, to, to play rock and roll. You have to find a guitar and, <laughs> you know, you, you, you bash out some tunes and you make, you start making money. You go on tour. You could, anybody can do it, you know, and anybody can make it to the top if they're, the right combination and if, if they're good players like Guns N' Roses or uh, and, and this is the whole mythology around hip hop too and yet when we talk about Iran and particularly post-revolution Iran that just being able to access an electric guitar and amplifiers let alone to access the music to learn from and and uh, love and all of that there's a class dimension to that not everybody could afford this so so in fact the people who were playing rock music in iran were were quite well <laughs> off and pink floyd becomes associated with a sophisticated kind of wealthy thing to be listening to as opposed to a rock and roll underclass isn't that interesting <laughs> That's so interesting because actually that's a very interesting analysis because, you know, power projects and influences truth. And here we're talking about a power struggle in two different societies. One is that, you know, is trying to fight against the establishment and what is considered as to be powerful you know the classical music of the western world and the you know it projected a certain level of sophistication and now you look back in iran the power of being able to kind of even consume and even assimilate it kind of makes creates this the the, the perception of that oh my god this is the real music this is true this is the true form of art both are uh, dealing with power Power struggles. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, John, for this opportunity. It's a very good question that you have asked, and already with what you had said uh, from, uh, you have quoted from other participants, it makes me very eager to hear the whole conversation as soon as I can, or you put it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope Thank your son you. enjoys it too. You take care of yourself, brother. You too. Bye bye. 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 Oh
You are listening to part four of a Rook special series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession, coming to you on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Telegram, Instagram, and YouTube. Also, for all the episodes in one place, just go to our website, rookmedia.com, where you can get more information about our show and uh, check out other episodes as well. Our next guest was born and raised in Tehran, where he started playing guitar at the age of 15. During his late teens and early 20s, Anush Sabuktakin became one of the first guitar players in Iran to perform and teach complex musical techniques of the modern electric guitar. He also became one of the pioneers of underground rock and metal music in Iran before he moved to L.A., where he joined numerous projects and continued his music education, earning a degree in music composition. In 2015, Anush moved to New York City, where he is active as a guitar player, a composer, and a producer. He's also the man behind the engaging group Muslim and a Mexican, who sometimes perform repertoire from the 60s and 70s Persian pop rock to classic rock and blues classics. And right now, Anush Sabuktakin joins me from New York City today. Hello, sir. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure to talk to you, and you're a great guitarist, you're a songwriter. How aware of Pink Floyd were you when you were growing up in Iran? Well, my introduction to Pink Floyd was really early, like at the age of five. I remember that uh, my uncle uh, had a tape that had the, this baby crying in there, and, and I knew that from the tape of the baby, and then later I found that that was the, the wall. And so... <laughs> Basically, that tape was what I knew of Pink Floyd, and I loved that. And since the age of five, I, I kind of like, I don't know what was about that music that really grabbed my attention, but it stayed with me, and to this day, it didn't let me go. You're a fan, and I'm assuming you're a, you're a fan of Gilmore as a guitarist as well. Absolutely, yes. So, so the, I mean, the hypothesis of this special is that, you know, Pink Floyd has had this disproportionate connection um, for and with Iranians, both inside Iran and in the Iranian diaspora. And a lot of people have commented uh, w- that we've had on the show so far, making giving us different reasons for that. Why do you think Iranians have gravitated towards Pink Floyd so much? Well, I believe it's it's a mix of things. Is that the time that, especially like you know, the music was opening in Iran and uh, the music was coming in, and Pink Floyd was just you know at the height of their career and and albums that they made during like mid to late seventies, and especially the Wall, where where I was like introduced to that music. It really was at the right time, and I believe the right place now. Uh, for some people, um, their introduction was with the, the political aspect, and the you know they also gave him like you know that rebellious side of music that was kind of like familiar to Iranian culture that wanted to like you know get out of the shell that they had, which you didn't really feel and connect with, like let's say the Beatles or. Led Zeppelins, and you know, it it was not as stranger to Iranian culture. And in the end, the music, because for me, Pink Floyd, like the instrumentation and the attention to the musical side of it, and making these grand intros for their songs and developing it, it really connects with the, I think, with the way that even our Persian traditional music is like basically the songs are really long and it develops into different movements and Pink Floyd did it perfectly like you know having songs that are 20 minutes you don't really see that much from like you know other bands that came at that time oh that's really interesting and I, w- I want to take the two points that you just made uh, uh one at a time in fact I'll, I'll start with the second one you were just making about grand you call them grand musical intros uh and and the long compositions that's very interesting because you're right pink floyd i mean notwithstanding a couple of you know 
another brick in the wall, which is a single or something like that. It, it is not known for three and a half minute pop ditties where you get to the chorus in the first minute and, and you make it radio yeah. friendly, you know, uh, and, and nor is really progressive rock in general. Th- this point has been made, but you're the first person to really emphasize that there may be something in that in that traditional Persian music or what people are used to listening doesn't just come in three and a half minute packages. Is that what you're suggesting? You know, the way that I see like the people that I saw and and during my life that they liked Pink Floyd, for example, like my grandfather loved Shine On You Crazy Diamond (laughs) intro all the way. And, And he didn't speak a word of English. He didn't know what Pink Floyd was, but he loved that song so much that we later after he passed we were calling like you know the grandfather song because wow. he just loved it and the thing is like you know he connected to the music and the and the melodies and the playing and that whole development i can't really pinpoint that you know the persian culture maybe is is related but i think iranians like like good melodies and like it to, to see and hear it developed not just like as you said like a three minute yes the pop genre in Iran, maybe the pop rock genre was looking for for songs, but even like most of the pop songs that you see are not really the way that it was the the popular standard. They're back not. In the they're day. not. She loves you. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Iranians like a little bit of sadness most of the time, and they like like you know deeper deeper things that that kind of connect to them. And I think Pink Floyd kind of touched up on all of that stuff, plus the music and plus the the timing of like you know where all this thing was introduced to Iranian. You, you talked about the timing of the wall, which obviously was important for you. How how important was the fact that the wall, an album about um, government suppression, Big Brother, authoritarianism, uh, came out the same year as the Iranian Revolution? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I was five years old and I wasn't really aware of any of that. So my introduction wasn't really anything through that. But later on, I, I, I've i noticed that, okay, well, that whole song, like we don't need no education, basically, it really touched up on any different movement that was anywhere else. So I'm not sure, like, you know, if if it was important to to Iranian revolution at the time or anything like that. But a lot of people kind of felt that, okay, this is, this is, this is the rage that I had. And then somebody is like, you know, speaking to it. So they, they connected people who connected with the lyrics. Same thing happened later on with like, you know, in the eighties with a, with a metal scene, like, you know, when Metallica and, and other bands came and, and then was that anger that, you know, the young kids like gravitated towards, I think. That had like some elements of it, but I really am not sure how important it was. And Anush, can you, for, for those of us who grew up in the diaspora, like I, you know, I was born in London, grew up in Canada, or, or for non-Iranians for that matter, can you explain a little bit the, the culture of access to popular culture and, and, and music in Iran in the in the eighties and nineties. You're not the first person to talk about. I mean, Aras Sopani, Ramin Sadiri, they, they, uh, uh, Roya Arab. They've all talked about how people learned about music from their older brothers or, or sisters, and and so a lot of the classic Floyd stuff from the seventies was getting passed along to younger generations in the eighties and nineties. But talk to me about just just how difficult it was i mean growing up again in the west i could access whatever music i wanted not on the internet of course didn't exist but go to a record store and get whatever you want you buy the record you buy the album through the 90s you buy the cds you know uh talk to me about how you would access music in iran and and where you think pink floyd fits into all that yeah so you know in in countries like England and United States and Canada, there is music industry. And when there is an industry, then there is a business that that is designed to make the industry work. And that didn't exist in Iran. So you didn't have radios that play the songs of the day. You didn't have record stores. We didn't have any of that. So basically, what was passed along was what we were exposed to. And um, there was a a place stereo tall i don't know if you know the name you probably have heard of it that was copying music and basically uh 
that was one source that people were getting it, but it was always coming from like the older brother or the uncle or somebody who was cool in the family and listening to like <laughs> cool music. And then you were like, okay, what do you have? And you were going in the room and taking a look at their cassettes and, and things like, oh, this is cool and that is cool. And then you were hearing it. And then when you were going in school and you had, you know, people that at your school that they knew and they were introducing you to new music. So it was just very organic. And it's really interesting that a few bands, not just Pink Floyd, like became very like popular, at least like, you know, between rock musicians, like the band Camel, the British band, <laughs> yes, was, was yes. very big in Iran. And like when I came here, I was very surprised that Nobody knows, dude. I've ne- I, I, so, I swear to you, I feel like a an idiot, but I've never R- Ramin Sadiqi. We started talking about Camel, and I was like, I don't even know what that is. You know, like, yeah. And he's like, What are you talking so, about? This is a huge band, right? <laughs> yeah, in Iran, it was like super popular. It was just basically like I'm not saying it was as popular as Pink Floyd, but definitely was like you know as big as Led Zeppelin or anything else in there. And then when I came here, nobody was like, Who's Camel? So that tells you like how music industry has shaped this side of the planet uh, and that side was just basically organic whatever was was getting out but but it's organic but i still don't i I, it's still hard for me to get my head around sometimes how random it seems what pops and what doesn't like for example i've heard that and you could obviously speak to this as a guy who's steeped in metal that that metallica were big in iran right um or or are big in iran And, and and you'll look at a band like floyd obviously which we're talking about on the flip side, I mean, uh, you too, you know, a, a an internationally pro- probably the biggest band of the last four decades. Not not so big in Iran. Doesn't make a doesn't make a ripple in Iran. Uh, the Rolling Stones, you know. So it's strange to me uh, what pops and what doesn't. What 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 seems to have seeped into the the, the Persian pop culture DNA and what hasn't. Uh, and is that just random or is there something in the music? Yeah, I think it is in the music. It's not it's not purely random. Some of it is random, you know, I don't know to what percent or what degree, but it is in the music. Like to me, like U two was always like too pop and I couldn't really grasp anything that like really touched the chord, you know, in me. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. But uh Pink Floyd or like, you know, a band like Metallica, they 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 hit it like they touched something with people that it was in the music there was either some sort of uh, some sort of emotion that they were really bringing out in their music which iranians could connect to like iranians could not you 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 living in iran you couldn't connect to rolling stones why song. not though i mean the stones it, were just, stones were the original rebels as well i mean why 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 would yeah but their their rebellion i believe was at, of a different kind and a different texture it just was like a rock and roll way of life and just you know s- singing songs about uh, jumping jack flash and things like that you just like w- what does that mean in my life living in in tehran it's just i don't i don't get it but you know when 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 you listen to we don't need no education we don't need no thought control that's one thing you're like completely like people who listen to that kind of music and people who understand english they would definitely get it and then people who like also music like me that purely got into the musical side of it there was like this ocean of musical vocabulary of guitar playing and solos and intros and outros and It's just compositions that it was complete. And they backed it up with like, you know, movies, like, you know, they did the wall movie and then like the Pompeii back in the day and and all of that stuff. So it was just more of a complete picture for us to 
have something as of substance. Listen, I don't, I, I won't get too into the weeds here because we'll <laughs> lose the audience. But I have to just momentarily defend you too, <laughs> because because <laughs> I, I, yes, I'm a fan, but and and I think that y- of course they gravitated towards a more pop kind of sound, or at least they were seen that way because they became just so huge, uh, or they still are so huge. But yeah. you know, I could make a case. I mean, if we if we wanted to, and if we took the time, I could say you know that early 80s album war with songs like Sunday Bloody Sunday I mean I could make a case why Iranians would be able to embrace those lyrics and the the militant uh, strums of of the edge on guitar and and really embrace that as some sort of um, representation of the revolutionary spirit they felt or or the 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 desire to uh, overcome a suppressive regime or whatever it just it still seems so interesting to me what has popped and what hasn't yeah i think that you have a case there but you know that that's more of a intentional effort try to like get into it and try to bring all of that stuff out of it as with pink Floyd, i think they kind of like hit that that medium right at the spot that really is popular enough for a lot of people like my grandfather to like their music and then it's deep enough for a musician to enjoy it and it's got some you know anti-government and revolution and anger and also talking about like you know different aspects of life like you know dark side of the moon like you know things things about like time and money and, and things that everybody can relate to. I was going to say when you, you've made the case that you really discovered Pink Floyd through the wall uh, and that was uh, an album you, you would end up really embracing. Did you then go back while you were in Iran into the back catalog and, and, and wish you were here and, and dark side of the moon and, and the seventies works, if not the late sixties works with Sid Barrett? Yes. Yes. I started after that trying to find more about the band that, that what's out there. And then I remember I got uh, Wish You Were Here, and I loved just the whole album, and then uh, Dark Side of the Moon, and and then Animals, and all of that stuff that I listened to, I'm like, okay, this is just great, I love it. And then I tried to go back, and I went all the way back to the beginning, and, and to me, it didn't sound like the band that I knew. I'm like, what is this? Like, the Sid Barrett era to <laughs> yeah, me was yeah. completely alien. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, you're not doing enough drugs. You, you, you really gotta, you gotta hit the LSD hard to really understand that. I was but, born a little too late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> a, a final uh, question. It's, it's great to talk to you. I, uh, I And this isn't an easy one to answer, but but what do sure. you think the, that the impact of Pink Floyd has been on Iranian musicians? Well, I think it has been massive. It's like it, it really kind of opened the door of looking at music not just as a song and more of a concept. Like they, they could perfectly execute like, you know, an album with a whole concept going through the album. So a lot of musicians like looked at it that way and then for me, as a as a guitar player, it really, really like you know Gilmore's guitar playing and the way that he develops melodies and sound and all of that stuff. It really, you know, to this day, I'm I'm learning and 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 uh, it's never ending. So for me, the impact was massive. Anush, it's great to talk to you. I appreciate the insights. I appreciate the time you've given us, uh, and Thank I look so forward much. to seeing you. Thanks, my brother. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. My desire and ambition There's a hunger still unsatisfied Our weary eyes still stray to the horizon Go down this road we've been so many times The grass was green and
You are listening to part four of a Rook original series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. This part dealing with storytelling, classics, and conclusions. Coming to you on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Instagram, YouTube, and Telegram. Also for all episodes in one place and all the information about Rook you need, rookmedia.com is our site. Our next guest grew up a child prodigy, especially in the realm of music. Sonos Sotude started playing piano in Tehran at a very young age and continued her music education with a master's from McGill University and a postgraduate study at the Royal Academy of Music in London on a full scholarship. She has lived in Montreal, London, and Dubai, and Vancouver, and has toured all over the world. These days, Sonos is writing and recording music that fuses Eastern Persian sounds with classical Western traditions. And she recently posted on social media about just how much the Pink Floyd album The Wall means to her right now. Sana Sotudeh joins us from Dubai. Hello. Hi, Jan. How are you? I'm good. How are you in Dubai? I'm good. I'm actually very good. Enjoying the weather. Things are kind of in like normal here so it's surprising me and uh it's fun yeah it's fine to be here <laughs> well lucky lucky you uh, let's um let's talk pink floyd you you are a classical musician of course but were you aware yeah. of pink floyd when you were growing up in iran uh yes i was uh well i um studied classical western classical piano at the conservatory in tehran and during the time that i was growing up uh, rock music was very popular obviously as um, as part of this musical pop uh, styles and pink floyd was one of very famous popular uh, rock bands and um so being in the musical scene um, I was uh, I got to listen to their music and I became familiar to it uh, during that time and I really um, yeah that's how I get uh, into their music. So when you got that's- to start knowing uh, Pink Floyd's music and obviously I know you're a fan now w- what is appealing to you coming from a, a classical musician's perspective and mindset what's appealing mm-hmm. about Pink Floyd? You know, I um, I really love their music. It's um, us- I usually don't listen to many rock bands um, because uh, I don't relate myself to uh, to their style much. But Pink Floyd is de- definitely one of my favorite musical bands because um, their music has very strong beats and especially that they have philosophical lyrics. Um, and also, um, is there something about their a music style that is very transparent and effortless compared to other rock bands that I've been listening to. And I like uh, the philosophy behind their lyrics. Uh, especially I love their uh, rock opera album, The Wall, and um, because of the strong message of freedom behind it. In general, freedom in society, in educational system, freedom from government that treats the citizens like chess pieces, to my opinion. Um, so I can totally uh, relate um, my, uh, like how I see the society uh, to, their, to what they're trying to carry behind their album and their uh, songs, you know, like um, uh, the content. And I haven't seen other bands try to carry this message so effectively. And uh, Something that we've talked about on this special is that the music, um, not just the lyrics, but the music itself can feel quite melancholy, quite sad, which is mm-hmm. is not out of step with a lot of Iranian music. Um, is that mm-hmm. something that, that uh, appeals to you? You know, I relate their music to uh, one of my favorite classical composers, uh, Franz Liszt. Uh, not only their music, it's not like specifically about their music, but their uh, how this pianist, his Franz Liszt was a very famous virtuosic kind of rock star uh, type pianist of 19th century. And he also 
um, was fed up with the aristocratic society of his time and was drawn into freedom and free living style of gypsy music. So he created this music, um, piano music compositions of very virtuosic music compositions that they were depicted being this Hungarian um, free life style and spirit. So, and he was one of my favorite composers and, and pianists of all time and still is. And I played many of his music. And I really relate Franz Liszt with uh, Pink Floyd because they kind of, they want to carry the same message through their music. And also both, they have very, um, their music is very beautiful as well as complex and you can actually listen and enjoy but but then you they have this philosophical and um, strong message uh, for their society of their time and uh, behind it as well and that's how I um, get interested into also Pink Float music because I see that uh, in their in their what they try to do your sense of things is that um this music was passed along and particularly after the revolution in, in the years um in the, mm -hmm. in the decades after the revolution this was the stuff that really stuck with people because of the message behind it exactly and i still i i really think still rock music has a star, uh, strong impact in iran still because they try to break through, you know, like through uh, the rules and all these uh, uh, imposed ideas of their society. And uh, that's exactly how it is in Iran, like between young people. And um, yeah. Can I ask you a final question about um, the sound? Uh, you know, Reza Mogadas was on and he was saying, um, as opposed to other rock bands, one of the reasons why Pink Floyd would actually um, have has such a following and continues to amongst Iranians is that Iranians are not as attuned to listening to distorted guitars. And even though mm -hmm. Pink Floyd's a rock band, they don't use a lot of that sort of distorted rock sound uh, and that that makes it more palatable for uh, the Iranian ears. Does that make sense to you? Uh, I'm not sure about um, specifically Iranian ears, but even to um, my ears as a classical pianist, you know, that I'm used to listen to Western music and other, like, like I'm not like completely Iranian listening to Ir Iranian music. Right. It's, uh, it, the music is very refined, you know, and it's uh, pleasant to listen to. And um, it, it's similar, that's how it related to the, to the classical music because in that way it affects you more deeply in the soul rather than makes you agitated or trying to, um, with effort, uh, enforce something to you, you know. So um, that's what I loved about music. Even their album, The Wall, which is a very strong in terms of lyrics and music, but it's still you can hear very uh, simple. It has this simplicity and effortless uh, in their music, which makes, uh, makes me or probably other people, uh, makes it easy for them to listen to it. Sanaz, it's uh, always nice to talk to you. Thank you for doing this all the way from Dubai. Thank you. And uh, I hope to talk to you and see you soon. Thanks. Thank you, Jean. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. do you think they'll drop the bomb? Mother, do you think they'll like the song? Mother, do you think they'll try to break my balls? listening to part four 
of a Rook original series, Why Pink Floyd? An Iranian Obsession. This part dealing with storytelling, classics, and conclusions, and coming to you on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube. Also, for all the episodes in one place, you can see them at our website, rookmedia.com. Well, our final guest on this series is an Iranian rock and blues musician who has had the distinction of actually being named by a few of our guests during this series as one of the pioneers of bringing Pink Floyd to post-revolutionary Iranian musical circles, even though he himself was only born three years before Dark Side of the Moon came out. Arash Mitui was brought up in an art-loving musical family in Iran. He began taking piano lessons at the age of seven and became familiar with the basics of Western classical music. But given that his mother was celebrated Iranian vocalist Sima Bina, Arash was also introduced to and grew to love Iranian music and culture. But the lure of Western popular genres was what really captured Arash's heart. By his teens, he was playing rock and blues music on the guitar and forming underground bands with friends and by his 20s had recorded a couple of albums and started doing private underground concerts. It was during this time in the early 1990s that Arash Mitui was known to cover a fair amount of Pink Floyd music too in the popular underground music community. Arash has become somewhat legendary for his role in that scene. At present, Arash has been focusing more on the blues and a new collection of music arrangements on Hafez poetry to be released soon. He's also performing concerts of his recent works whilst performing on new projects, including compositions based on the works of the great poet Chayom. But right now, Arash Mitui joins us from Tehran. Hello, sir. Hi, Jian. Nice to talk to you. A great pleasure to talk to you. You know, I have to say, as I did in your introduction there, you, you've been mentioned by, I think, four guests so far on this special as one of the main people who was responsible for the spread of Pink Floyd in Iran. Are you aware that you have this status? Yes, that's one, one of the wonders about me, I know, because uh, I'm really not uh, very uh, active in uh, performing and recording and uh, uh, but nevertheless, many know me, especially when it comes to uh, specialized subjects like uh, this Pink Floyd or whatever in this uh, rock and rock and roll music. Uh, that's because uh, at the time when we were teenagers or young fellows were uh, just playing the music underground as it was abandoned. So it was just underground and we were just uh, a few uh, who loved this uh, Western music and we just played and practiced and uh, joined bands and played uh, home performances on the ground. I mean, the, the news spread very much and very quickly by the word of mouth. So uh, many knew us yes. uh, at that time. With, with the you became legendary, as I, as I said. Uh, let, take me back first, because I want to ask you about these underground concerts. But first, take me back. I mean, you're only born in 1970, as I say. So it's not like you know you were one of the guys listening to Dark Side of the Moon or or wish you were here when it first came out. Um, how and when did you first discover Pink Floyd? Uh, let me just quickly say it's a very pleasing compliment to hear that I was only born in 1970. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I anyway, hear you, brother. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, subject of your question. Yes, I was, uh, I think, 18 or 19 when uh, uh, I I didn't really, uh, I, uh, I really listened mostly to uh, old-fashioned rock and roll music and wasn't into Pink Floyd at all. A few of my friends uh, listened to Pink Floyd, however, and they introduced me to Pink Floyd. And uh, interestingly, it was uh, very heavy for me, the music, and it was uh, really difficult for me to even uh, listen to one of their songs all the way to the end uh, because it felt so dark and heavy for me. Uh, so it took me uh, time to really get into Pink Floyd. Do you remember what the first album was that you heard, or the first uh, was it The Wall? Yes, I think my friend uh, ga uh, gave the "Wish You Were Here" tape to me. Okay. And, uh, well, that very slow and spacey start really uh, uh, set me off at first. But gradually, I started to uh, get more and more attracted to the music. 
uh, until a time came when we uh, played Pink Floyd with my band day and night, and we also gave a couple of concerts underground. So, so for these for people who didn't grow up in Iran, like like me. I mean, I have friends like Shia and others who tell me about these underground concerts, but I really don't know how they happened. I mean, I know that the music was banned, and um, it, it, it sounds almost scary, like to be you know outing yourself as a rock musician or something. How would you organize these things, or who would organize these things? Um, because of course they became very famous, and there was this pipeline of. Um, I, I'm told people who would come and see a, a concert and come and go, and and the word would spread. Uh, how did how did these first start? So yeah, it just came out came naturally. Uh, we didn't think uh, uh, of any idea to come up with. I mean, uh, we just loved this music, and some people like me, for example, had their home open uh, to any friends or friends of friends and other people who knew us or me. Uh, would come to our home in the weekend to just uh, listen to us jam. It was an atmosphere of such. What what songs would you play? I mean, what was your favorite Floyd stuff to cover? Uh, I I think we started with the Wish You Were Here with the Crazy Diamonds. Shine on you Crazy Diamond yeah. because of the guitar solos and then uh, the song in general, and you were the. I'm assuming you were the David Gilmore of of the the band as the guitarist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Later on, of course, uh, think that uh, Roger w- Waters is really uh, much more pivotal in uh, defining the character of the Pink Floyd. Sure. Yeah, I could see that. So okay, so let me get into this question, which is basically the the theme of this special, because you would have a an interesting perspective of it. Um, I mean, let me just ask you the question boldly first: What is your theory about why Iranians love Pink Floyd so much? Yes, I uh, did think about this. Um, see, Iranians are uh, very uh, intellectually profound people, you could say. I think. They have a very uh, rich cultural heritage on one hand, and on the other hand, they have been through, I mean, uh, generation after generation, their lives have been affected and demolished by various political, uh, social events like coups, revolutions, etc., etc. And all of these things, I think, have uh, made uh, Iranian people a people who tend to uh, have a philosophical approach towards issues, you could say, I think. And uh, and the young generation, and especially the artistic and uh, musician and cultural class, uh, tend to seek values beyond uh, the fashion of the day when they encounter the Western culture. I think this is important. Like a, a band like Pink Floyd, uh, who have uh, the standard exciting attractions of a rock band, and also uh, more mouth-filling uh, ideas behind their music, uh, I think have uh, become naturally a great attraction for Urania. I mean, it's a really a strong argument uh, that the, the conceptual, the philosophical, that is so much of what uh, the, the lyrical, so much of what Pink Floyd is, is about, that if you're uh, attracted to those qualities, then you're naturally going to be attracted to the span. But what about the musical? I mean, you're a musician, even you yourself. Why Gilmore? Why not Clapton or Beck or Peter Frampton or Eddie Van Halen? What was it in the Pink Floyd music that you so gravitated towards? Uh, I think uh, if if you're talking only about the guitarist, I, I can see uh, from what I see, uh, Clapton is very famous and uh, loved in Iran as well. But uh, yes, Pink Floyd's music, I think it, as a whole package, it has uh, great attractions because it is a rock. It has all the excitements and, uh, and also uh, they are much more deep in the concepts or subjects they are uh, putting forward. 
uh, deeper uh, social, uh, uh, philosophical, or even political ideas. Uh, and I think Irelians uh, relates very much to these characteristics. It's such a great pleasure to get to speak to you. I, I want to ask you what your favorite album is, um, and, uh, and then maybe your favorite Pink Floyd song. I have a suspicion of what your album is because you've you've already said that you think uh, you've you've learned about the importance of Roger Waters. So I I'm guessing that eliminates a momentary lapse of reason and division bell. You're eliminating the the, the later Floyd albums, and and you haven't really mentioned the Wall at if all. You, so if you can't call that a Pink Floyd at all, <laughs> oh come on, really? You 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 don't you you don't accept that as Pink Floyd. <laughs> Yeah, 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 really. I, I just find more Pink Floyd in uh, Roger Waters' uh, later solo, solo stuff. Yeah, well, that's you're not the first person to make that argument. So I'm guessing your favorite album is Wish You Were Here. Am I right? Uh, no, I would say Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, wow, you trumped me. Uh, <laughs> and and would, that, would your favorite song be on Dark Side of the Moon then? Um. Uh, Stuck here a bit. Uh, let's say. I know it's it's not easy to pick one. It's, uh, it's very difficult to <laughs> pin one song. Uh, yeah, us and them and uh, uh, the lunatic. Is that the last song of the Dark Side of the Moon? Uh, no, the the not the lunatic. Um, uh, brain damage. Brain damage. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's sort of the lunatic. Uh, Arash me too. It's a it's it's a it's a great pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you for your perspective, and uh, it's been so good having you part of this series. Well, thank you, Jigan. Nice to speak to you. Bye bye. Bye. This is full time for this Rock Original series. Hey, Shia. Hi. How are you? Wow. Wow. Uh, it, it was, for me, it was like, uh, you know, like a, a course in university, you know? Yeah. It's like... A, what an education. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. What a collection of people. It's been um, an adventurous and, as you say, educational six yes. hours of or so of content uh, uh, thank you really i thank you to bring up this uh, question that why pink floyd <laughs> I, i'm really grateful for all the guests who joined us uh, on this little journey and, and shared their insights i mean in the end this exploration has proven to be uh, much more than about a beloved old rock band uh, or fandom or even music this is about uh, understanding the cultural path and the preferences of uh, people who've been through a lot in the last half century. Some of it self-inflicted, some of it inflicted upon us, uh, upon them. Um, and it turns out the special relationship of Iranians and Pink Floyd is about big concepts and characteristics of a people. Perseverance, communication, collaboration, industriousness, yes. defiance, and resilience. Yes, it went to our DNA. Yeah. yeah. So we invite you guys out there, your thoughts on what you've heard uh, and the premise and thesis of this series. Uh, please let us know on any of our platforms or uh, email us at info at rookmedia.com or, or just tell us how much you like Floyd. You can do that as well and why. Or give us feedback on what any of the particular guests had to say. Our website, rookmedia.com is where you can find the hub of all things Rook. We would love you to become a patron as well, and you can find out info about supporting in whatever way you can uh, this program on our support page on our site. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together day in and day out. Producer Susan, Ponta the artist, Thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, Savvy Roham, Agai Mehrdad, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya, who've 
uh, both put so much work into this. Everybody has. Um, and this is a labor of love for everybody. Um, it's mostly volunteer work, and, and it's a great team. Thank you to you guys. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Uh, please subscribe if you've not done so already. And thanks to Pink Floyd for all the inspiration. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Mizun Bashin. Smoke